Thank you, Michael. You know, no matter how many times I hear that music and listen to those lyrics, I find myself deeply moved, including now Miss Saigon, because I was lucky enough to see it. Uh, while we segue from the songs to the conversation part, I uh, thought I would tell you part of the backstory about why uh, Alain Boublil and Claude Michel Schoenberg are here too. Here, because I know that you too love what they have brought us. Uh, those of you who know me know that I am a nut for French author Victor Hugo, everything he wrote and uh, that I take every chance that I can to teach what I love most, Les Miserables. So I'll teach it in French, I'll teach it in English wherever I get a chance to talk about it, as you all sadly know. Um, I, I dedicated about four years to writing an introduction to Hugo's ideas, and my current project is to work on the conjunction between the musical and Victor Hugo's novel because I find Les Mis to be absolutely brilliant. It captures the heart of Hugo's novel in so very many ways that I couldn't resist doing this book project. And for the book, I dreamed of talking with the artists who created the musical Les Miserables. Last June, I saw a chance of a side trip from Paris to London, where I understood that composer Claude Michel Schoenberg lives. He graciously accepted my request to talk with me. And then he showed me around his home in London. After we talked, he also gave me a ticket to Miss Saigon, which is why I've been lucky enough to see it. And while we were touring around the house, Claude Michel played a bit of the demo tape that he and Alain Boublil had made to find the producer for the original, Les Miserables. It is really powerful stuff. Uh, it's Claude Michel playing the piano, singing all the parts, all the characters in French. <laughs> and it's like, blew me out of the room. It's so amazing. And so we shared experiences with Les Mis. I told him that I have been teaching a course about the novel and the musical, and that I was, in fact, teaching it again this fall. Some of my people are right here in front of me. Would you like me to come, he asked. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that would be amazing. I mean, what can I say? <laughs> it was hard to say anything, really, at that moment. Invite me, he said. I was so easy. And so I was standing there in his music room. I said, this opportunity is far too good to be true. What is, I mean, this is a miracle. And then he invited his collaborator of over 40 years, librettist, lyricist, and author Alain Boublil to join him here. When Alain generously accepted, all of us were really thrilled. These men are dynamos. They got here last night after my bedtime. And so far today, they've talked with the students in Les Miserables from page to stage to screen. And they've talked with the London Study Abroad students who saw Les Mis at Queen's Theatre. And they talked with former students who formerly have studied Les Miserables and still cannot get enough of the story. Over the next couple of days, they will be talking with a host of students and faculty and people in Charlottesville who are working on the music and theater. You know that their work has received many, many more awards than we can possibly list. Tonys, Grammys, Golden Globes, a British Olivier Award for the Best Musical for their Martin Guerre. Their Les Miserables, the world's longest running musical, has won 76 international awards, played in 42 countries, and has been seen by over 70 million people, some of them right here in the room. <laughs> Miss Saigon played for a decade when it first opened in London, has since played 300 cities in 15 different languages and has been seen by over 40 million people. Please join me in giving a super warm welcome to Alain Boublil and Claude Michel Schoenberg.
Thank you so much for coming. I can listen all evening to you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Singing our praise. No, well, I can do it a long time. Wonderful. Well, no, we'll, we'll let you talk a little bit. We'll is, it the, little. is it the way exactly it did happen at home? Is yes. Oh. I memorized the conversation like that. It was really... Uh, I learned a lot from what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was great. It was great. So I, I know we have a lot of Les Mis fans in the audience, lots, of, lots to talk about, not enough time. We want to talk beyond Les Miserables as well. But can you tell us how it came to be, how Les Miserables got started? Les Miserables. Yes, your well, Les Miserables. I hope not to disappoint you, but quite simply, I was watching the musical Oliver in New York, in London. And uh, as you know, this is a wonderful musical written by Lionel Bart, based on Charles, a novel by Charles Dickens. And uh, some ma for some magical reason, while I was watching Oliver on stage, half of my brain was watching Oliver, and the other half was imagining Gavroche in the streets of Paris. And all the other characters of Les Miserables came to my mind in such a way that I could not dissociate them from what I was seeing on that stage. So I thought there was kind of hidden message there. Claude Michel and I have been, had been looking for our next subject after our first musical, The French Revolution, for two or three years. And we were always saying, we, we must find a subject which is big enough where you can express uh, you know, all the ideas and the music and everything that we want to do at kind of operatic level, we were saying. And suddenly I had the impression that I was coming across what we were, had been talking about for so, many, so, so much time. So I went back to Paris, read the book, quickly browsed through, you know, it's 1,500 pages. <laughs> so, <laughs> so made a few notes. One of them, I remember, was quite important. It was about the chapter about Fontaine's descent to hell. And I remember there was a line which in French said, I had dreamt of another life. Well, you know, that became a song, which you may have heard of. <laughs> and I called Claude Michel and I said, look, I think I've been thinking of something which is probably crazy, much too complicated, much too difficult for us. No one will be ever able to put it on the stage. You know, it's impossible that I'm going to tell you the same. And I said, Le Miserable. And he said, let's start work tomorrow. <laughs> Here we are. That, that was in 1980, uh, 1978, 77 exactly. And so how long did it take you? Uh, first of all, the, the French, exactly the French phrase was, J'avais rêvé d'une autre vie. Which is? Ah, yeah, you can yeah. demonstrate. <laughs> it's totally improvised. She didn't explain it. Yeah, please. And I'm not going to sing. So it's, it, <laughs> Me neither. It's exactly like that. J'avais rêvé d'une autre vie. That's all it started. <laughs> Don't stop. <laughs> So Susan Boyle wasn't, wasn't born then. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was taken, but first of all, you must understand that in France, there is no culture of musical. So I was a big fan of opera work, and I loved musical, but our only chance to see musical was to go to see the movie to see Wayside Story, and by that time, after the French Revolution, the 1789 French Revolution we did, we started to be interested in, in a musical, so we bought ticket to fly to New York hmm. for $90 <laughs> on a company called People Express. Which, which has gone bankrupt since. <laughs> You understand why? <laughs> they used to fly from Brussels to New York, and the old plane was holding together only because of the new painting. <laughs> 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 
but we managed to come to New York to see some musical and after to travel to London. So we thought that we were learning about musical and we did what uh, we thought was right. And uh, after the French Revolution that we structure first like 24 songs illustrating the French Revolution and after we did a link between the songs to create a proper show, we were dreaming having a wonderful score like Anna said, an opera prologue, three act and epilogue. And of course, when he brought me that beautiful book that you have, it's already uh, something with a lot of uh, interesting uh, meat inside. And we thought it was a perfect subject for uh, our ambition. And, uh, but we started the way we thought it was good to start. We describe what's going to happen in stage. In France, the novel is very famous. So we started at the factory immediately. And after we little flashback, we attained the story. And we started in order. So the first song I wrote was At the End of the Day. And uh, after came, uh, I dream, uh, J'avais rêvé d'une autre vie, and the rest. But it, it took us two years. Took you two years. Two years to Correct. achieve that famous demo that you heard at home. Yeah, the famous demo, and you've... No, but I have it at home because Tom Hooper, the, the director of the movie, wanted to go back to the roots hmm. of the movie. So he, he, he meant to have the, the proper... Uh, to, to burn a CD from the old tape. Yeah, so you I have it on CD. We weren't actually... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Marva, may, maybe you can rename your course from page to demo, <laughs> to stage, <laughs> to screen. We should. We should go back to the original You forgot we, one we, step. Yes. <laughs> did, I forget that step, but yeah. you didn't. And so you had the demo tape. Absolutely. You found a mm. famous French director, Robert. It's in After two months, of waiting for a phone call, because nobody wanted to do it, except one guy who, called Robert Hossen, who was a famous French director. Well, before him, I must say that, mm -hmm. someone who unfortunately passed away, René Kletman, who I think is good to yeah. mention here, who worked at that radio station where I was working for three months after my studies, which we discussed this afternoon. Uh, he was the guy who said, you have something very important here. Let me see if that famous director will accept to listen to it. And he's the one and, and he came who to, sent him to us. Yeah. But he came back curiosity because he didn't want yeah, to course, do. It was out of he it. didn't want to do anything who has to do with singing. I said, I just wanted to know how you can how you dare, dare to touch Les Misérables and to have people singing. <laughs> so he said. Guys, I'm coming, but it's just, I don't want to do it just because I'm curious. And he sat down. Yeah. And, and he stayed still during two hours. But still, and that the first and last time of my life I saw him. Still. <laughs> still, because he, he has a reputation of being uh, quite uh, bumpy. Hmm. And after two, hour, two hours, he uh, st stood up and said, Okay, guys, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and he did it. And so it played in an arena like our John Paul Jones arena. It's played in a sports arena, yeah, not 4, a theater. Seats. like the, 4, well, It's, it's a kind of arena like you have today, like the American Airlines in Dallas. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's that kind of place that you can transform overnight into whatever you want. So it could become a theater, it could become a basketball mm -hmm. place, it becomes a boxing ring, uh, whatever you decide. And uh, I must say, it was done very well for Les Miserables. And obviously, it was the kind of staging that you would expect in an arena. It was with a lot of people coming in and off stage all the time. And, like you know, tableaux. It, 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 it was uh, very different from the Les Miserables that you know. But our first purpose was not to do that version. We really wrote it having in mind a real, proper Italian theater. You know, we really thought it should be done in a real theater. But none of the theater in Paris, including Le Chatelet at that time, mm -hmm. 
which is one of the most beautiful Paris theaters, uh, would hear about it. I mean, they just, yeah, I remember the manager of that time at Le Chatelet was himself a famous, well, not famous, kind of famous, <laughs> com com frustrated composer, uh, Lander, said to us, Lander's if you team. want July, mm -hmm. maybe you oh, can have July. the theater for a month. Let me tell you, in July, everything closes in Paris. <laughs> and, and still does. <laughs> but it was a big hit at the Palais des Sports. It was a huge hit. It was sold out sold for two out. months. And, uh, and it closed, like everything does. And there is no other life, because the, this director doesn't travel. He doesn't fly. So he would not even consider going to Lyon to tour mm. the show. <laughs> Could have taken the train. That's him. Even in the train, he's scared. <laughs> he just doesn't move. Well, he wouldn't take the elevator to come to my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what did happen is that what happened? a director from Manchester called Peter Farago yeah. bought the record, that the original it's French the record. record. I'm singing Kofirak part. And, uh, Are you singing the Kofirak role? Mm -hmm. So he bought that original French Concept recording album. and went to see a young producer in London called Cameron McIntosh and gave him the record, say, that's a musical we have been running in Paris, now it's closed. And it was two years after we closed in Paris, so now we're talking about... At least, about it was three years. 82, 83. 83. And Cameron looked at the record and told him, French musical, it's a contradiction in terms. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't exist. And he put that the record. That was not the worst quote. He put the record. Worst was to come. The, he put the record there. And one rainy Sunday afternoon, he had nothing to do in his flat. And he was organizing and tidying everything. And he found the record. And, uh, just to, and by curiosity again, he put it on the record player. And he told us that after the second song, he decided Which was I Dreamed a Dream in French. <laughs> <laughs> he decided that's going to be my next subject. And he ran immediately to see So, Alain, he, so Alain, he called the French Author Society. No, but he went to see first Alan J. Larner, yeah. who wrote My Fellow. Who listened to it to say is Cameron, I can't write about true people, real people. I'm writing only about a world of fantasy. I don't write about true people, but you have to do it, definitely. Mm. And he, he was in the hospital dying at that time. Mm. Mm. So Cameron called through the author society. He found my number. And he called one day, and he said, I'm Cameron McIntosh. And I said, who is that? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and he said, I'm a producer. You may have heard of me. Uh, I produced a famous musical, and I said, ah, how is that called? And he said, Cats. <laughs> and I said, I was thinking to myself, that can't be good news. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I said, so what? And he said, uh, can I come to Paris and see you? I want to discuss Le Miserable. Well, I thought he was joking, you know, I mean, was serious. So he said, uh, your partner, Claude Michel, uh, and I said, uh, I would like to invite you both to lunch in Paris. So lunch happened in a fancy Paris restaurant. But first, the history says that Claude Michel didn't say a word at that lunch, which is not true. It's still the same. Huh? Because I heard him <laughs> speak, and, and Claude Michel, according to Cameron memory, says that Claude Michel didn't speak because he was judging him. <laughs> which I don't remember. But in, in the meantime, we went to London to see Cats. Yeah, in the meantime, we went to see Cats and, 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 and loved it. We realized, right. we realized it was serious work. It yeah. was not... Uh, and the amazing <laughs> amount of, mm. of work that was put mm. to make this amazing story uh, by T.S. Eliot into a musical was just something that contradicted every rules of the musical theatre when, when it happened. And we were very impressed. And the rest, shall I say, is history. <laughs> so the next step for that, so you agreed to work with him. 
obviously. And <laughs> yeah, obviously. So it's 1983. No, but, no, no. But you miss. You miss. Uh, there is something to, to be said. Mm -hmm. Cameron could have told us, "Sell me the rights, and I'm doing what I want with it." But he asked us. We were brand new writers. We didn't have any experience in musical theater. He said, I would like to produce it, and you're going to rewrite it. And we he, said, well, he said more than that. He said, I will only do it. If you come to London from day one, when we are going to start to reconceive your show, because he said, it cannot be done exactly the way it is here. Because you have, you have some obvious mistakes in the way you have share the material, some of the songs between the main characters and all that. I'm going to invite to the party Trevor Nunn, John Kerr, the people who had directed Cats, Nicholas Nickleby. At that time, Trevor was heading the Royal Shakespeare Company, the most prestigious company in the world. And suddenly, he was telling us that we are going to be at the same table with all these people, John Napier, the most famous English set designer of the time. And we're all going to sit at the same table equal as equals, and decide how we are going to reconceive Les Miserables to make it a project for an English-speaking audience. So he said, if you don't come with me, I won't do it. You have to come to London. You are going to be in London more often than you will be in Paris. And he said one very good thing one evening, I don't know if you remember, he said, because you know at the end for me, it's only the writers who are important. So at some point, I'm going, to, I'm going to be fighting the director, as usual, and all the others. So it needs to be us against them. <laughs> he said that very early in the game. And so what was it like? So French speakers, your con concept was French. You write music to speech, and you were thinking French speech, and you wrote French lyrics, and now we have uh, English-speaking lyricists coming on board and this whole new musical theater world that so you walk it, into. Of course, it, it, but Les Miserables, it's, it's ours. Because we and I had the idea, we did it together, we wrote the script, music, lyrics in French. So it's not a, a work on commission. So it belongs to us. So we managed to have to supervise everything happening. They could not rewrite the lyrics, even in English, without Alain. And of course, it was out of question, because I'm very paranoid, to write one note of music not being done by me. So, and it always been like that. But Cameron was feeling that what we had been writing was so different mm -hmm. from the rest of the, the material existing in those days that only us could have rewritten Les Miserables with that flavor he, he loved so much the first time he, he listened to the record. It and was not always an easy task. No, no, of I must not. say, because we were going to work, us unknown, and having proved nothing except having sold out a show in Paris for eight weeks, uh, we are going to be at, you know, working with people of immense talent and previous experience in the English, Ameri in, in the English musical theater. And I'm talking here, suddenly we are going into translate in English, adapt in English, reinvent sometime in English, and add some new songs and some new scenes which were not in the French show into English with two enormous collaborators. One was James Poet, the James most Fenton. famous English uh, James Fenton. Fenton, the most famous English poet, you know, still alive, and who, uh, with whom we've been working for six months, about mm -hmm. six months, in order to conceive what is known now as the prologue of Les Miserables, which didn't exist in the first version, like Claude Michel was saying, we were starting the show at, at the end of the day, because in France, everyone knows what happened before. So you can start a little later the story. And then, when Cameron thought that uh, Fenton was, had done wonderfully what he had to do, but he was not the right person to write the lyrics of the show, that's how we met with Herbert Kretzmer, 
who has done the wonderful English lyrics that you've been hearing by the company tonight. So I'd like to pick up on what you said, Claude Michel, about the unique qualities of your work, of, the, of Les Miserables, the sung through nature. I didn't say qualities, I said difference. Difference, I yeah. say qualities. <laughs> I heard, I thought quality. So I, I think that it's qualitatively different and Cameron McIntosh saw something different that he wanted to move forward with. So I just wondered if you could talk about doing uh, your work as sung through as opposed to a book musical where they're speaking and singing and or the, what I hear as operatic qualities of your work. But we were not following at all the rules of the musicals. The first rule being having a title that nobody can promise. <laughs> <in English. laughs> no tap dance, no, no dance sequence, <laughs> certified dead bodies on stage at the end of, at the, end of the show. We add everything against us. And that's the first thing that everybody talked to Cameron. Starting with the subject matter. Yeah, it's a suicide. It's a suicide. At the same time, we were totally uh, doing what we thought was right, complete sung through, because that's the only thing uh, we knew how to do it. We had a vision of it. And as we have been explaining a lot this afternoon, the book himself, itself is such a, a written opera. It's, it, it's an opera, the book, that it inspired you flowers of music, of sounds, of song, of big orchestra. You, it, it's very natural to imagine Les Miserables with music and people singing, because that's another question we're always asking to ourselves why they are singing and why they are not talking. And Les Miserables, it's a beautiful subject to see, like a lot of wonderful subject. Some of them are not done at all for musical, they are done for play or movies, and sometimes you have failure of a few musicals and one last year in London, because it was not a musical. It was a beautiful play, but certainly not a musical. There is no reason to sing. To sing something, it must be bigger than life, because the music brings you an extra dimension in the way you express the feeling and, and, uh, and the emotions. So it was a perfect subject, and we thought that to, we could have, it could have been a classical opera, Les Miserables, and as we were saying this afternoon, Puccini himself thought about Les Miserables in 1903. And he gave up because it was too complicated. Because he, he didn't have Allah to write the, the <laughs> lyrics. He had to that. wait for. Maybe That's what he should. says in his memoir. He couldn't <laughs> find the right librettist, he said. <laughs> yes, so he had to wait for the, the, the two of you. Yeah, yeah. Ah. But he didn't mention me. <laughs> no, no, well, he didn't mention me. Anyway. So, Les Miserables has played in, I think, 330 different cities in 22 different languages. If you say so, yeah. That's <laughs> what lesmis.com says. And you're often there. You're helping casting and you're, you're watching. Very them. often. What is it like to hear your work in different languages? First of all, when people are talented, you forget the, the language. I remember being in Japan, and uh, there was a beautiful fountain in Japan, a beautiful actress singing very, and I totally forgot that it was in Japanese. It was not the point. And, uh, but we're not coming back into the theater anymore to enjoy the music and the lyrics. We enjoy the performance, we enjoy the singers, like tonight, Thank you very much. It's a per perfect example how fresh the interpretation mm. was tonight in the voices of the students. is is wonderful because they kind of reinvented the emotion, not the song, but you know, mm. some emotion that went through and the way the conductor has uh, put together the two versions of Do You Hear People Sing 
from the song and then from the finale of the show was, I thought, very fresh and very moving. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I don't imagine that there is a painter in love of his painting, because you know too well what you did to write it, what tricks you have been using, how difficult it was, for instance, to write at one day more. It was quite a traffic jam in my brain. Yeah, I uh, want to uh, ask you about that. It, it took me two weeks to, so I, it's not like uh, at the piano, suddenly inspiration and everything is coming in. Never happened like that. It's work. It, it, it's work. It's really, it really and work. And for me, it became like a mathematical work. It's like, okay, so you have that, and then Eponine is singing here, and then she's singing that. Then she should repeat what she said before. Ah, okay, then I can spare 10 words. I don't have to write here. I believe. And including Miss Saigon, is that true? Am I, did I It, it depends. We, that? We're not watching all the production, and we're not... Uh, but the original Miss Saigon, we oh, oh, yes. Saigon. That, that was the quest that was the world. Where, because we thought, thought that it's impossible to find the Asian girl who is very young, 17, we can, and we will be able to sing like a diva. Because to sing eight shows a week of Miss Saigon, when I'm using the lower range and the higher range of the voice, the high E, it's very, very, very difficult. We thought it's impossible. So Cameron decided to do a kind of world tour, London, New York, LA, San Francisco, Hawaii, where there is a lot of Asian community to check if there is a girl able to sing the show. And by chance, I saw on the French television in 88, a Filipino movie. I did not even knew that there was a movie industry in the Philippines. And it was all about a revolution and the independence of the Philippines. And they were all sitting down around the fire in the evening. And one guy took a guitar and he started to sing. And he was like a Jose Feliciano. I, I did not understand. I saw an Asian singing like an Italian. I said, but who are those people singing like that? And I saw a second Filipino movie, exactly with the same quality of voice. And after I realized that they had 300 years of occupation of Spanish, uh, 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 Spanish they were a Spanish colony, so they had a strong base of Spanish culture. And after they had 100 years of Americans, so they were speaking American and singing like European. And musical theater was a major art form in Manila. We didn't so know that. So suddenly we discovered, like, you know, a huge less source. And Cameron decided to buy another ticket for everyone, plane ticket. <laughs> we all flew from Hawaii to, the, to Manila, landed in Manila, and then it was a fairy tale. It was, you know, like in Chorus Line. Everyone was good. Uh, you don't know who to, who to choose. And, and it's a dilemma, you know, you just don't know. And, and there are some wonderful memories for this first casting, cash, uh, casting session in Manila. Uh, on, on the last day, suddenly we had the first, like in Chorus Line, we had the first bunch of people who were not going to be in the show. And Nick Heitner, the director, said, let them come into the room. And he started to speak to them and he says, I'm sorry, we cannot, uh, uh, you have been wonderful, uh, we will see in the future because Cameron is thinking maybe of making a Miss Saigon school, which he did, and for the future, and, uh, but for now, and then he took them to the door, and, you know, and all of them left the room. And suddenly we heard huge shouts of joy. And we said, these people are crazy. You know, I mean, this <laughs> was, no, they were joyous for all the others, because they had understood that all their cousins and brothers and sisters were going to be cast. So the other enter the room, we tell them they are cast, and then all the others come in the room, and it was like a big party. It's like the casting of X Factor when you, you, you exactly. Watch it's the end of X Factor. <laughs> exactly, it was that a huge party in the room, you know, and and it's it's there we can never forget. 
But th there is on YouTube the first time I'm meeting, oh, yeah, you can see I'm meeting Leah, and I was teaching her uh, sun, and, uh, sun and Moon, and I was quite upset because sometimes she was ahead of me. I said, oh, my God, is it so obvious what I'm writing that she guess what's the music? But it's not that. It's, she's so talented. And last week we celebrated in London the 25th anniversary of Saigon. And she was there. She came from the Philippines singing. And it's always so in, I'm so impressed to see her on stage. She's still uh, a star. And she was 17. Okay. And we found a new kid for uh, that new production in London. And she's from America. She's from North Dakota. But she was born? But, but she's Mexico-Filipina. <laughs> of course. From North Dakota. E Eva Noblezada. Noblezada. And she's beautiful. And, and she's beautiful. Voice. And it's the second miracle in her life happening for Saigon. I want to ask you a question. May, may I ask? This is maybe a personal question. But I, speaking of YouTube, so I was looking around, and um, <clears throat> I knew that many of the cast came from the Philippines, though I had not heard this wonderful story you just said. But I saw on YouTube that last January, you organized, I think, multiple charity performances of your concert, Do, Do You Hear the People Sing, a charity to help people rebuild after the typhoon in the Philippines. Would you mind telling us about that? No, you know, we have a concert which we produce, which is a concert of songs from our shows, uh, all of, from all our shows, including Martin Guerre, The French Revolutions, and there are some little bits in French in it. And, uh, and, you know, and there are some sections of unusual moments, like the songs which never made up into the show, and the songs that were cut, and the songs that were shortened. And so it's, it's kind of evening about, uh, you know, uh, what, what we do. And, uh, when the typhoon uh, happened and destroyed that village, which was uh, called... Uh, it, it was the Yolanda typhoon. The Yolanda typhoon. So called Michel called and he said, we should do a concert uh, for them. It was not easy to organize, because mm. you have to convince, as you know, sponsors, even for a charity event. So uh, uh, we convinced, uh, it was not Save the Children, but a um, similar organization. English, if I, if I remember, and uh, together we're able to build any e two evenings. And uh, this concert, we thought, OK, if we are going to do that, Lea Salonga must lead the evening, which she agreed. The usual cast of Do You Hear the People Sing, including my wife, Marisa Mora, who is in the audience, uh, Obviously, I agreed to do, the evening, to do the concert for nothing. And then all the Filipino actors and singers who had been in Saigon, who happened to be in Manila even not, even at that not. time, all wanted to be part of it for free. So we find ourselves, usually we do this concert already with 50 choir or 60 choir, 70 musicians, a symphonic orchestra, and five soloists. So, Suddenly, we find ourselves with 200 people on stage, <laughs> you know. And the evening was amazing. I mean, the musical level of that evening was incredible. Uh, we also must thank for that the people of a resort, which is famous in Manila, which gave the theater for nothing. Uh, and uh, at the end, we collected, I think, 500. 28 million pesos. Which yeah, 560. Twenty thousand dollars to rebuild two hundred and we rebuilt houses. We rebuilt like uh, yeah. two hundred houses, two hundred and two hundred houses, uh, which were destroyed by a typhoon. So it was good. The result was uh, exciting, and uh, and and the artistic level of the evening was amazing. Oh, thank you. And so I know. There, so that's a humanitarian effort. We know that those of us reading Les Miserables know that Victor Hugo was driven by humanitarianism. And I know of some events, charity events, inspired by Les Miserables. I wonder, do you, is, do you know of them? There was one in London a few years ago, a couple of years ago, people feeding the poor in the 
sort of honor of Les Miserables. I just no, wondered that, if that was part of the no, no, tradition is, of the musical. There is always, uh, Alain, as running the publishing company, has to give authorization, but there is a lot of demand of uh, people participating to charity evening and mm -hmm. singing, uh, uh, except from Les Miserables. It's going on and on. It's non-stop. But we were not around. personally part of them. No. We right, just give authorization, you give authorization uh, to play for free or things like that, but we are not... We were never part of, except that one in Manila, which was a, a real big event. Because it's a country who gave us so much that we had to give it back, uh, a little portion of That's what wonderful. the country gave us. That's wonderful. So um, are you willing to talk about your work on the 2012 movie of Les Miserables with Tom Hooper and how, how it was that, how you reinvented the, the stage musical for the stage from the French to the English version, to the Cameron Macintosh version. And then this is another reinvention that you worked very closely on for the film. And my understanding is the film was filmed out of order. That's how films are, filmed are what? out of order. Of so course, another, it was, that's, that's, of course, a, that's how movie, films yeah, are done yeah. in, this, in the set. Course, so yeah. that, that's one of the things that seems to me so that would we, make it very difficult. I just wondered how that process was for we you. We heard about the project of the movie by the producers uh, from a, a working title, who are the English producer of the movie and Cameron. But they warned us, frankly, at the beginning, that you're going to discover the movie on the, f the night of the first screening. <laughs> so, yes, really. And thanks God, there was a director called Tom Hooper who wanted to do a lot of research on all the different versions of Lemis on the original demo and everything. And we knew that the stage show is not a movie, the same way that the book is not the stage show. And Tom wanted to do a complete musical version of the movie and not a spoken movie with sometimes some time one or twelve, uh, one song of Lemis at the producer at the beginning thought it's going to be. They said, but I want an all through some movie live on the set. So that was starting to raise question. And of course, everybody realized that the score, it means lyrics and music, are the script of the movie. So very soon in the process of the movie, we have been involved mm. from the very beginning, and we, we uh, all the meetings were in my room at home, where we spent hours and hours and hours of listening, of rewriting and re rewriting. So, finally, we, we co wrote the screenplay mm. of the movie that we were starting to watch at the first review, and, uh, and it was a marvelous experience because we were teaming up with an extraordinary film writer called William Nicholson yes. mm. from. Gladiator and from the, who had written the Mandela movie, which has just been released last year and all that. So he's maybe the first one who said, I cannot do that on my own. I need them, he said, because they are the only one who know the show inside out. So Tom Hooper came back and he said the same. And he said, will you join us and will, will you become the co-screenplay writers? And from there on, we never left you know, the team, and, and we were writing. With and them. as really the movie, let's say, 95% of the movie was recorded live, mm -hmm. except big scenes like the uh, funeral of General Lamarck and the very beginning when you have thousands of people in the dock, you can't do it live. You have to have at least a pre-recorded tape with squires. The rest was completely live, and I remember you, Jackman, singing <coughs> 15 times the soliloquy because there was a very difficult movement with the camera, and it was all live. So we had to be there to enjoy or to think, my God, what they have been doing. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do after? Uh, with us? Oh, it's, wrong, it's wrong, we are in the wrong key. So uh, it, uh, it's too expensive, we can't stop, we can't change it. We can, uh, by the way, it's, maybe it's time to say hello to you, Jackman, mm. who is the reason why, we, the other reason why we're here tonight, because 
-hmm. It's through you recommendation that we made contact with Marva. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, she's a terrific woman. You should speak with her. She has plans for you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about these plans. Those were, those were their plans to, to come and be with you all. Yes, um, people around the show have been very generous uh, to me. Can we talk about your creative process? So you have been collaborating with music. You've both written songs before. You were pop songwriters. I don't know whether you want to talk about those early days. Um, Claude Michel, you had a top song on the charts for, I think, 16 weeks, Le Premier Pas. Yeah, Is that yeah, right? Yeah, a long time ago. A long time ago. So they yeah. were pop song Orient people. But it was already Alain, because, of course, I wrote a song and everybody was telling me it's not a song, it's five minutes long, there is no chorus, no verse. <laughs> so it, it, it can't be a good song. And then I told me, but why don't you do it yourself? And I said, but I don't want to be a singer, I don't want to go on stage, I'm not an entertainer. He said, but nobody wants to sing your song. <laughs> <laughs> Honesty. So he right? produced the recording. Shortcut. <laughs> he produced the recording, it was in 74, and after we were at number one, 16 weeks. So, of course, after all the dogs and horses wanted to sing uh, my song. <laughs> <laughs> so? So, uh, when did you meet? How did this collaboration of, I don't know, 40 how many years uh, Well, start? we met, met very simply through, without knowing it, without having met, we had the same tastes. And one day I was listening to a song on the French radio, and uh, this song sounded like something which seemed very familiar to me. I wouldn't, I, at that time, I, I would not have used the word theatrical, but that's what it was, in fact. And my own lyrics, which I wrote for some famous French singers, or not famous at the time, uh, you know, were also always trying to tell a fiat, like a whole story in three minutes. So, uh, I mean, a life story, more or less, in three minutes. <laughs> so uh, I called the radio station. I asked, who is that singer? Who wrote that song? And uh, they gave me the information. I made contact. We discussed. We started conversation, which is still going on. <laughs> <laughs> but as I, we said this afternoon, when young people were starting what how do you collaborate and uh, how it makes your collaboration working. It's not a collaboration of a producer saying, oh, would you meet uh, Alain because he is going to work with you on that project. We had first understanding friendship and from where the collaboration is coming. It's the other way around. So you, together you write, the, you write the script, the story, then does what comes next in all What comes next? It depends, because when you write the script, and you know, we are storytelling people, as you can say from our musical. So the storytelling, we believe, makes a musical. We believe that no good song, no good lyrics can save a musical when the story is wrong. And that's proven every day. People go back in order to try to rewrite or to make the story uh, good enough for the stage because we have many examples of musicals with wonderful songs like Chess, written by Abba, you know, which has two or three amazing songs. Uh, and it could never fix the story. It's just not right for the stage. So anyway, the story, why we write that story, and even if you start with a novel like, heavy novel like this one, uh, the editing work, the fact that we choose a scene rather than another one, the fact that we decide that the Thénardier are going to be funny, even if it's funny dark, rather than being just dark or just funny, uh, is a decision that makes your story go ahead, progress in a different manner. The fact that we eliminate certain characters, the fact that we get rid of the Battle of Waterloo, or we get rid of other events which we think do not belong to the musical stage, uh, or do, are not needed, at least, <coughs> at, at least in the musical. Because of all these decisions, 
the new script, even if it's based on Victor Hugo's story, become our story. It's our version of that fantastic novel. So from there, you must know that along the way, obviously, as we are drafting for morphs and morphs the story, the script, like for a movie, some notes accompany that work. Some, I'm talking notes of music here, I'm talking some words. Some, so we don't, when we're finished the story, we're not like empty-handed. We have a story and now what do we do? We have a beginning of, oh, maybe that could be, uh, you know, Claude Michel remembers saying, uh, you know, like we need a big anthem for the students and all that. And I'm pretty sure that at that time he already had the da da di da 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 da, maybe it's five notes, you know, or something like that. As I told you before, I had the contents of that song, which would become I Dreamed a Dream. I had the title of that song, which would become I Dreamed a Dream, and which was summing up 50 pages of the novel. So we have like stones, you know, thrown in, in different parts of the script. And we start from there. But we start from page one again for, of our script. And then the task comes to write the opening song. What is the opening song? In the French show, it was at the end of the day. So Claude Michel tackles a difficult task of writing at the end of the day. And for that, usually the, when we go in that order, meaning in chronological order, the music comes first. Very rarely the lyrics have come first uh, because there is so much of what the lyrics are going to be in that storyline, in that script, that Claude Michel doesn't need the lyrics. He knows enough of what it's, they are going to be saying that he can write the music from there. And everyone says that Claude Michel music tells the story anyway without lyrics. And I must say that this is one of the reasons why I admire what he does, because I understand exactly the story. <laughs> He's on tape. Mm. Am, I, am I on tape? For yeah. posterity. <laughs> For posterity. It took him 43 Good. years. To, uh, <laughs> 43 years yeah. before he to told get me any what admiration. To <laughs> so, you know. It's true that the story is there before you write. So obviously it comes of our long conversation, but still the music tells that story before the words, and that's very important. So can you tell us what you're working on these days? Yesterday. We were working yesterday, and we were been working in London last week. And uh, I must say we are 70 plus now. Mm -hmm. Not the but, way you run up the stairs, you but are I not think, 70 plus. I think that we still have to deliver our most beautiful work. And that's what we are working on. No? Anna is doing uh, some project on his own. I'm doing, I'm writing ballet or some other project on my own. But we still think that we have a part, a new production of Martin Guerre that on which we are working for the moment. We think that we have one more important work to do and hoping that it's going to be the most beautiful so project. From what I understand, have. before we can go to what we believe will be our best work, we have to clear our minds by finishing Martin Guerre. Yes, can you tell us which about we are going Martin to do soon. We are going we are in the middle of it and we are progressing well. And and Cameron thinks that he wants to produce Martin Guerre one more time. It's what he calls, hopefully, its definitive version, if that exists. <laughs> I haven't asked you that you wish I'd ask that you want to say something about That's it. the part I don't like at the end of the evening. <laughs> well, you can say no. <laughs> you you can... said it was all your evening. No, that's what it is. What I will say that when we are back home, we're not spending our life thinking, oh my God, Elise arrived with such a big success, Miss <laughs> Egon. And it's so gratifying for us to come back here, to come here, and to realize that there is so many people passionate by 
what we have been writing. And each time I am amazed. We come into Charlottesville, sometimes it's happening in Australia or in Japan or anywhere in the world, and then that's where we realize the dimension of what we have been writing, because we are not aware at all and we're not living on a cloud of success at home. We have a normal life, we are dealing with our family, uh, wife, children, and, uh, and everything. But, but it's wonderful to see all of you here passionate about, about the subject. And there is something else that when I realize what we have been doing, it's happening several times that I'm watching a show anywhere in the world, can happen everywhere, anywhere in the world. And suddenly one of the girls, the lead girl of the show, come to me and say, you know, sir, I'm doing this job because of you, because when I was young, I went with my mother. It's always the same story. I was 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and I sang Eponine at school. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I saw Eponine on stage, and I decided that has one to do in and my it's life. That's a true story. Yeah. It's happening so many times, and you realize that how much you have been affecting people's life, uh, how much Saigon has changed uh, hundreds of life for Filipino people. That's where, for us, it's, it's again, it's the human touch that it's the most gratifying part of our job. It's not to hear the music and to have a 75 musician when you realize that somebody is coming to you and say, you changed my life, or I'm doing this job because of you. For me, that's the most important. And that's what I feel each time I'm coming, and I'm sure it's the same for Alain. When we see all of you here, and your student talking and being passionate about Javert, about all the characters, it's wonderful. And for this, I will never thank you enough. No, thank you. Total delight. It is a total delight to have you here. I look forward to tomorrow. I want to uh, let you all know some opportunities very nearby that you have to enjoy Alain and Claude Michel's work. Coming up, uh, our own live arts theater downtown in Charlottesville is performing Les Miserables starting opening on December 5th and going into early January. Les Miserables is back on Broadway and it will be uh, spiffed up by our guests over the next couple of days and even better. I see online that the definitive live recording of Miss Saigon is released in the US today, right now. And the Do You Hear the People Sing concert that Alain was uh, giving us a nice overview of is going to be at the Kennedy Center in late March with our own now, I feel like our own Marie Zamora, Alan's wife, will be in that show. So I hope you get a chance to enjoy some of that. I think that you might agree that, that we're all very lucky to live in a time and place where we can appreciate and enjoy all that um, you are continuing to bring us. And so I hope that you will please join me in thanking the incredible Claude Michel Schoenberg and Alain Dubuque.